Bronwyn Kidd. Uh, she's the founder of Systomi, a Tasmanian company that's devoted itself to trying to help people get to zero waste, which is a perfect topic for, for us at Foundry because we do a lot of that kind of thinking, definitely about the future and what waste does uh, within our course. So please put your hands together and welcome Bronwyn. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me today. Um, so as Matt said, I'm Bronwyn and I'm the founder of Systomi. Uh, so I'll just quickly tell you about what Systomi is. So we are a lifestyle brand and we help people go zero waste simply in style. That's our mission. Um, so we're really well known for our beeswax food wraps. Um, you might know what they are, which is a reusable alternative to a glad wrap. So it's an all natural material. Um, it's purely handmade and we actually make them here in Tasmania um, and then we also stock lots of other reusable items um, and basically they all have to act to replace a single use plastic and um, it's all around food storage too. Um, so I'm, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about my story and how I got started. So I actually only started two and a half years ago um, with no background, ex no background experience in business or design. Um, and I'm going to tell you about how I came from, from an idea to actually getting my business off the ground. Um, and two and a half years later, I've now got a team of five people um, and a studio down in Hobart. Um, and yeah, we're growing, which is really fantastic. Um, so... My journey so far, so I actually grew up here in Launceston um, and I went to university here. I actually studied something completely different to what I'm doing now. I actually went and studied exercise science because, um, you know, I thought, oh, I'll go and be a physio. Um, that'll uh, give me a way to help people. Um, but I actually ended up working and I worked for only about three months part time and was like, nah, this just isn't for me. Um, and then I actually packed up my life savings and I went traveling, I traveled the world, I went backpacking in South America all by myself at the age of 22 uh, for four months and that actually led me on to travel the world for another few years. So I went and lived in Germany for a couple of years um, and when I came back from traveling, um, that's when I really decided that I wanted to start a business. Um, and you know, Systomi really was not an overnight success. Um, I actually tried lots of different things um, before I actually started Systomi. So I realised I wanted to start a business. And I thought, oh yeah, that, that'll be easy. You know, I've read all these blog posts. People do that, no problems. Um, and I started a few different things. I started things like an online marketplace and I also started, you know, a website for connecting coaches and athletes. Um, and I also, you know, tried to be a personal trainer in a country where I didn't even speak the language. That was a bit silly. Um, and a few other things. Um, so I did fail a lot before I actually started Systemia, but I learned so much from each of, that, each of those things. Um, so has anyone here actually launched something and just literally got crickets? Like, yeah, lots of hands going up. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to put yourself out there and you put all this energy and effort into your project um, and then people don't do anything with it. You know, you get absolutely no response. Um, so, yeah, my hand is extremely high for that one. Um, so, the way I started Systomi was I actually started with only $200 in my bank account. I'd been travelling. I had absolutely no money. Um, and so I had $200 and then I came up with this concept of helping people go zero waste. And actually um, came across the beeswax wraps uh, about two and a half years ago, we were actually sitting around the table with some friends and a friend gifted my sister this beeswax wrap and I was like, wow, what is this thing? You know, it's natural, it's reusable, it actually helps get your food fresh um, and it's kind of pretty too, like this is amazing. Um, so little determined me, went home that night, got on my laptop, I Googled as much as I could, researched about the product um, and you know, there were no new YouTube videos back then to teach me how to make it. So I actually spent the next week um, trying to work out how to make it. And I actually just made my first sample just in my dad's kitchen. That's how simple it was. You know, I didn't need anything fancy. Literally, just beeswax, the ingredients, 
some fabric and my dad's kitchen. Um, and so I created this sample and I got the product to a point where I was like, yeah, I could actually sell this. Um, and then I had to go on and create all of the things that you need to actually sell the product. So I created a logo. Um, I didn't have any design experience, like I mentioned, but um, yeah, I was always into photography and playing around with Photoshop at school and in grade 12 I did art and photography. Um, and I really just used that limited experience that I did have to create my first logo. Um, and then I also needed packaging. Um, you know, I know nothing about that. So what I did, I actually jumped on Canva, the free tool, um, and made a concept and um, just ran with that for my first uh, rendition of my packaging. Um, and then I also needed to create a website and thankfully from all my failures, I'd learned how to use WordPress and I knew how to create a very, very simple website uh, with a product where you could actually purchase the product. Um, and I also had to work out pricing. And the way that I did this was I simply took my cost of materials, how long I thought it would take me to make a product at some scale, um, and then you know, times that number by four to give you enough markup to sell at retail and wholesale. Um, so that was the, the minimum price that I could charge. And then I actually just researched my competitors, because you know, I'm not going to lie, I wasn't the first one to do it, and I'm not trying to be the first original person to do it. Um, and that really gave me my pricing structure. So now I set up with my MVP ready to sell. So week two is when I started actually making sales. So it was a very quick transition. Um, and you know, my earliest sales were really driven by in-person interactions. So the first sales that I made were actually at a market. Some of you might remember the, um, the Avalon market that used to be out at, uh, uh, in Launceston, uh, it no longer exists anymore. It was a very small market. I went out there, grabbed a few things from my mum's kitchen, you know, laid out a table, a trestle table. It looked absolutely terrible. Um, I think I only sold about $150 worth of product that day, but that was enough validation to tell me that it, this is actually going to work. Um, and then I decided to also sell wholesale because I had this vision of being in shops across Australia and internationally. Um, so I actually thought about who's going to actually use the product and then what kind of shops they are going to shop at. So I targeted actually Treval and Grocer up on the hill um, as my first store. Um, you know, I was super nervous. I went in there and all I had was my first sample. I literally had one product, um, this absolutely minimal packaging that was I just printed out on a piece of A4 paper at home, um, wrapped the product up in it. I had my price list. I walked in there and I uh, had no idea what I was doing. I told her about the product um, and actually two minutes later she'd place an order for $600. Um, and I was like, wow, is this what happens? <laughs> um, and yeah, so from there I uh, targeted other shops. Um, in week, by the end of week two, I had at least two shops in Launceston, um, the third coming on. Um, yeah, and then I also from that, those two experiences had my first online sale in the first week. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's just really important to um, hone in on those personal interactions early on because um, I was able to share my story with those people um, directly and they learnt from me and you know, I didn't need any fancy social media accounts or anything like that. Um, so. Moving forward to week 142, um, I'm just going to share a few of the things that I've learnt, um, particularly about sales, because uh, that is the most important thing, one of the most important things uh, when it comes to actually starting a business, because you don't, if you don't have any sales, you've got no customers, you don't actually have a business, so it's very important to do that. Um, and week 142 is actually this week. Um, so the numbers in your business, in your metrics, actually suggest what you should be spending time on. So we have tried lots of different um, distribution channels, especially for wholesale. So we have tried things like going to trade shows in Melbourne and Sydney. We've done social media. We've done cold calling. We've done paid advertising on social media. Um, we've even you know, gone down to um, stalking our competitors, see who, seeing who's stalking them, and then targeting them. Um, but in all honesty, what has honestly worked for us is actually um, 
targeted distribution. So working out who our ideal customer is, where they're actually going to shop, and they're going and targeting them. Targeting them, um, you know, gives you a lower customer acquisition cost, um, and it actually produces results. So who's heard of the 80-20 principle? Wow, I thought that would be more hands than that. <laughs> um, so the 80-20 principle says that 80% uh, of your results will come from about 20% of your efforts. And this can be applied to so much across life and business as well. Um, and we really found that 80% of our revenue was coming from just 20% of our customers. So we, from that, really learnt what we need to be focusing our time on. Um, and that was true for the way we were selling to our customers and also in our marketing. Uh, you know, when I first started my business, for the first year it was me alone. Um, and I was spending hours and hours on social media because people told me that that was the way to build a business these days. Um, in all, all honesty, I was spending 10 plus hours a week and guess how many sales I was getting online from social media? Probably one a week. It was absolutely nothing. Um, so it was a massive learning curve for me um, to look at the numbers. And I've also learned that the whole process of starting the business is very much a process. Um, and so continuing on from that, uh, the 80-20 principle, we found that um, the best asset for us has been our newsletter. So even um, as designers, you know, you're going to have clients um, getting people's details so you can target them again and get in contact with them, honestly, is one of the best things that we've done for our business. So I ask myself what I actually care about. And I think this has really come across in um, my personal life, how I spend my time, and also in my business. I think it's really important that all businesses need a purpose that they have a purpose because it really guides you forward and gives you a reason to actually provide value to your customers and it also helps keep, keep you on track and helps keep you motivated. So behind Systomi, we've got environmental reasons, we're saving plastic and we've also got health reasons because going zero waste, honestly, if you stop buying products in plastic at the supermarket, you're buying less processed foods and overall you're eating a more wholesome and healthy diet. So it really works hand in hand there. Um, and so from that, Sostomi's mission has actually evolved over the years. You know, I, I first originally said that our mission was to create a more sustainable home. Um, but in the past two and a half years, it's morphed and now our mission is to help people go zero waste, simply and in style. Um, there's a few key words in there I just want to tell you about. Um, so there's the zero waste side of things, but there's also the simply. Uh, so we are changing people's habits. We want them to change their lifestyle. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so we have tried to make it as simple as possible for people to change um, and bring on new habits. And then the style comes into it. Um, so, you know, when I started Sistomi, I didn't see anything out there that was um, targeting people that had you know, some sense of style that, and all the eco-friendly products out there were very much just, uh, dare I say, hippie, um, but they were all very earthy tones, you know, neutral greens and browns, um, and that just wasn't me, so I didn't want to go down that route. Um, so in thinking about that um, behaviour change cycle, you know, you've got to break things down in smaller steps. How, do you, how can you make it easier for someone to bring on your product, how can you make it easier for someone to change their ways? Um, and I decided to make it my mission to help people do it in a stylish way. So if they're using something that they feel good using, um, they might not even realise that they're doing a good thing. Um, So all of our products do um, act to reduce waste. Um, and one of the questions that I ask myself and my team asks when we do bring on a new product is how does the product 
take or add value from um, the, both the earth and the customer from the start to the finish of its journey. Um, so there are a few ways that uh, products are created and you know, economies are created as well in today's world. Um, and we see it very often that there is this you know, more of a degenerative approach where products will actually use lots of raw materials that are very harmful to the environment. Um, the product is used maybe just once, like a single-use plastics, like a coffee cup, for example. Um, in the production, uh, the outputs can't be used again. They will just go to landfill. Um, and they're used once, and then the product will ultimately also end up in landfill and becomes waste. Um, and then there's another approach that you can take where it's more of a regenerative approach. So you reduce the amount of raw materials that you use and think about the impact that they are going to have on the environment. Uh, you think about the cycle of the product while it's being used, how often it's going to be used, um, and what's going to happen to the materials when the product's life cycle is finished. Um, can it be repaired or can it be reused in a different form? Can it be restored or can it be recycled in some way? Um, and it's also about thinking about um, how that is going to become waste and how can you minimise that. Um, so for my business, for Sistomi, we have a few non-negotiables when we do bring out a new product. Um, our products have to ultimately help people go zero waste, so they actually have to replace a single-use plastic as the number one rule. Um, and they also have to help people um, do it simply and in style. And it also has to be OK for people's health. Um, and if it's not 100% reusable for decades, then it has to be made out of 100% natural and uh, biodegradable materials. So there are non-negotiables that really drive um, our products forward, make sure they fit our purpose. So when we bring out new products, um, we try and make sure that we design our products for use. So we use empathy to get an insight into how our customers are feeling, what their problems are, and how they actually want them to be best solved. Um, and there's a few different ways of doing this. Actually, that reminds me just quickly. I'm going to hand these around. So I've actually got a version of my very first product, which is the blue one. This was the sample that I made in my dad's kitchen. And then the black and white one is actually the product that we have today um, that you can buy uh, from us now. Um, and it really just gives you an example of how our product has changed and morphed over just two and a half years um, and how the functionality has improved. Um, and to get there, we have actually um, used observation of how our customers are interacting with them and what they're telling us as well um, to actually work out how to change them. So as Carlo touched on before, there's this process of doing customer interviews where you gain a lot of insight into your customers. Um, and you can follow a full uh, you know, half hour long format interview. Um, but actually, most of the time, we uh, actually just go to markets. We do sell like a market every weekend. We do some big ones on the mainland where our target customer are. And we actually will just talk to our customers there, ask them a few questions. Um, you know, what, what are they finding painful about making their lunch? Or, um, you know, what do they actually want to get out of using the products? Um, and how are we going to solve their problems? Um, we ask questions like, what do you like about X? Or what frustrates you about X? Um, and then we try and dig in deeper and ask why five times. And that really brings out some feelings and emotions um, that you can use in uh, you know, improving your products or designing new products, adding new features, um, and it can also help guide your marketing as well. And then you really find out the emotions that you can sell to. Um, and that's been fantastic, and you'll see from the samples just how that process of actually engaging with our customers and, again, talking to them, getting that personal interaction, has benefited us so much. So over the past two and a half years, um, like I said, I have grown from absolutely nothing to um, having a team of five 
and you know, I've got my studio. We're actually stocked internationally. We've got over 100 stockers just in Australia alone. Um, and I absolutely could not have done that if I did not look after myself. So I've actually, I work on this quite a bit, in all honesty. Um, I've worked out how I can enhance my day um, and how I can actually have bigger visions for my business. Um, and I've also set non-negotiables just like I have for my products. I've set those for myself. And the number one thing that I have as a non-negotiable is to get eight hours sleep a night. Um, if I don't sleep well, I don't function well. Um, so that's an absolute non-negotiable. Um, and I also aim to start the day right. So I'll get up before an hour before I have to. Um, I get up, do some exercise, and then I do some um, tasks to get my mind working optimally. So things like um, journaling, affirmations, gratitude, um, and then also uh, some meditation as well. Um, and yeah, I absolutely could not have done what I've done without doing that. Um, So to date, Systomi has actually saved an estimated three million pieces of plastic um, from being used. Um, and I'm really proud to say that. And I know I'm so proud to say that um, if we were to stop selling tomorrow, that number would continue to grow. Um, and I know that not all of you are potentially entrepreneurs, but I know you are all going to go on and design things. You're going to develop things. You're going to create things. You're going to manage projects. And I really challenge you to do those things um, and give them, make sure that you give people value and also do projects that make you feel great. Because who wouldn't want to feel good every day?